for people to come in. And then, of course, once everyone has arrived, we'll be able to um, get actual started here. And we're just about there now, I think. Yeah, I got very close. A few more people are still coming in. That looks good, I'd say. Welcome everyone to the WOMED Institute's webinar series, which has as its purpose to highlight the immense diversity of the Baha'i teachings and the ways that they contribute to the contemporary world, and particularly how they contribute to the prevailing discourses of society. Today, we're going to look at the history of the Baha'i faith in Russia, a history which is long and distinguished, longer than the history of the Baha'i faith in the United States, in fact. We will also look a little bit about the contemporary situation with the Russian Baha'i community. And I should add that we will not be discussing the current conflict uh, in this particular webinar, just to make sure we all understand that um, particular point. But let me move on now and say a little something about our upcoming webinars, just so that you're aware of them. We have several things coming up, um, webinars and courses in August. We actually have a very busy August that you should know about. We will have another webinar <clears throat> in the Religion and Science in the Globalized World series coming up on August 13th, which is basically two weeks from today. And then on August 26th, we have a, uh, a trifecta of three different presentations planned by the Baha'i Publishing Trust, all based on books that the Publishing Trust has recently uh, produced. A Child in the Holy Land with Gisu Mahajir, a book that she has produced. Servant to the Servants with Joel Nisen and Kathy and uh, Gary Hoganson. And then finally, Point of Adoration by Michael uh, Day. And those particular dates you can see on the screen. We also have coming up in August, three courses, Science, Religion, and the Baha'i Faith on August 16th, Seven Valleys and Four Valleys through Creative Arts Expression, which is a, really a lot of fun if you're interested in the arts on the 23rd. And then finally, Operationalizing Moral Excellence in Business on August 30th. This, is, this particular slide really gives you a good idea of the range of things the Wilmot Institute does, history, biography, um, you know, uh, science, religion, art, business. Uh, we really have quite a variety of, of uh, ways of looking at this particular religious tradition. But let me now move on and introduce our speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Mikhail Sergeyev, a dear friend of mine of uh, closing in on 30 years, it seems to me. He has a PhD in religious studies from Temple University. Uh, in religion and philosophy, and he's also very interested in modern art, and a, he's a modern, modern art historian. He served as the editor of a book series on contemporary Russian philosophy published by Brill Publishers, and he's been the uh, chair of the Wilmot Institute's Department of Religion, Philosophy, and Theology for some years now and helps to coordinate that department. He has organized many webinars for us on philosophical topics. Uh, and now history as well. It shows you the breadth of his interests. Uh, he teaches currently at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and he's also been teaching Baha'i courses uh, through the Graduate Theological Union of Berkeley, California on behalf of the Wilmot Institute, which is an affiliate there. Uh, though quite a few different things, he's published more than 200 scholarly, literary, and journalistic articles um, in a variety of countries, and he writes in both English and Russian, which is his native language. So uh, the man of immense talent, a breadth of interests, and a delightful person to know as well. And so with that, probably longer introduction than you had wanted, Mikhail, I will turn this program over to you and welcome you once again to the Wilmot Institute's webinar series. Thank you, Robert. That, that was too long. <laughs> that's for sure well I, I like to talk about you sometimes uh okay go ahead i'm gonna struggle here to turn everything else off uh, uh three yeah you'll have to 
you have to stop sharing your screen so that I, I can. I know, but I, I know. My... I've got to uh, move everything out of the way so that I can find the. Okay. I Here got we it. Go. Now that it's gone, I can now also turn off my camera and microphone. I couldn't turn that off until the screen was no longer shared. So uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you, all the viewers that uh, joined uh, <laughs> this webinar. Um, let, let me uh, begin uh, by saying a couple of comments. Um, uh, Robert was absolutely right when he said that we are not going to touch on uh, the um, ongoing uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I will be presenting the history of the Baha'i faith in Russia, but um, uh, while presenting the history, I will talk a little bit about current developments. And those current developments are unavoidably linked with the present situation Russia, Russia finds herself in. Uh, the second comment is about uh, the viewers. Um, uh, I see that the viewers are coming. And uh, if you are watching us uh, via Zoom, um, you could always um, write down your questions in the Q&A uh, chat. So please do that. We will reserve um, your questions for a Q&A session at the end uh, of my presentation. Um, those of you who uh, are watching us uh, via YouTube, uh, please do not forget uh, to uh, like uh, our presentation and to subscribe to uh, the uh, Wilmot Institute YouTube channel if you have not done so yet, uh, because uh, the more likes we have, uh, the more reactions we have, the more comments we have, the more questions we have, uh, the um, more people will watch this video because that is how uh, the YouTube algorithm is working. So uh, if you uh, do not have any questions, um, still uh, write something down um, uh, on YouTube as well. If you are watching us uh, already after the live stream, uh, also please uh, don't be lazy, do not procrastinate. Uh, write something down uh, on the, uh, bef um, below the video. Uh, write a comment, write <laughs> about uh, where you are watching us from, uh, or say something friendly. So that's what I always tell uh, bef now, before uh, I begin uh, my presentation. Uh, now, my presentation is about Baha'i faith in Russia. Uh, it's about uh, uh, Baha'i history and current developments. And uh, let me first um, say a couple of words about um, how I came up with this topic. The thing is that uh, although I come from Russia, from the Soviet Union, uh, I uh, emigrated to the United States more than 30 years ago, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, I never heard about the Baha'i faith in the Soviet Union. So the first Baha'is I met, I met in the United States. And uh, for the last quarter of a century, I knew little about uh, the Baha'i faith in Russia. But uh, because of the current situation in Russia, because uh, of the war between Russia and Ukraine, I got involved again um, with uh, my Russian friends. Uh, I uh, started watching uh, YouTube Russian channels. Uh, I kind of um, rediscovered my uh, Russian uh, cultural roots. Um, and um, I also made friends with many Russian Baha'is. Um, I um, did some research. I did several interviews uh, with those Baha'is whom I consider to be uh, prominent Baha'i scholars nowadays working in Russia. Um, and uh, as a result, um, I came up with this presentation, which I hope is the beginning of my research. Um, into writing uh, a series of essays and, and finally, hopefully, a book, um, not only about Baha'i faith in Russia, but Baha'i faith and Russia. Uh, because one thing is to trace 
the development of Baha'i faith in Russia. Another thing is to find some parallels, sometimes amazing parallels, between the Russian cultural tradition in the 19th century and in the 20th century and Baha'i teachings. Uh, if the first part of my presentation uh, may be uh, more or less known to my viewers, well, at least in a very short form, the second part, um, and uh, you will see uh, only glimpses of the second part in this presentation, the second part is completely unknown to the West and to the Russians, by the way, uh, because there are many uh, exciting similarities and parallels uh, between the so-called Silver Age of Russian culture of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and uh, the development of the Baha'i faith. Let me just say that uh, Baha'u'llah um, experienced his revelation when he saw the vision uh, of a woman, uh, the handmaiden, um, and um, a Russian religious philosopher uh, who was a contemporary of Baha'u'llah in Russia, uh, also saw three visions of the woman uh, whom he called uh, the Eternal Feminine. Uh, his first vision was in Egypt, uh, where he flew uh, because he was inspired and attracted uh, to something that um, he thought will happen there. Uh, and we are talking about uh, the years, um, the, the last quarter of the 19th century. Just one uh, amazing mystical parallel, and there are so many parallels like that, because uh, soul of your vision of the eternal feminine, or of Sophia, the wisdom of God, uh, became um, a very important current, not only in Russian philosophical um, uh, studies, uh, not only in Russian religious studies, but also in Russian poetry. Uh, there was the whole school of Russian symbolists, um, who are talking about uh, this uh, mystical union with the wisdom of God. Um, and uh, this uh, tradition um, was never uh, compared with the Baha'i faith, with, which was in the nascent state back then. So let me uh, begin my uh, presentation uh, by telling you a little bit uh, about my sources, uh, my uh, current. Uh, sources. <clears throat> the first one is, of course, Yuli Ioan Nesian, uh, whom I came to know for the first time here in the United States. He lived in the United States for some years um, uh, and taught here, by the way. Um, I believe he is the most prominent uh, Russian Baha'i uh, scholar um, living now in Russia. Uh, he is the author of several books including Introduction to the Baha'i Faith and uh, translations uh, of um, Baha'i texts. He's a scholar of Iranian Orientalism, uh, a candidate of philosophical sciences, um, and he uh, basically dedicated his life uh, to exploring uh, the role Russia played uh, in the history of the Baha'i Faith. Uh, back from its earliest stage. So he is an invaluable source um, when it comes to uh, Russian scholars of the 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, who did uh, a lot of translations of Baha'i uh, texts. Uh, so I will uh, be talking uh, a lot about those scholars, and my information about the scholars comes from um, Yuli Ioan the Sun and the interview with uh, Yuli. Okay, oh, let me see. So here comes another uh, great source, uh, Olga Merti. Uh, Olga Merti is uh, uh, not a scholar; she is a journalist. Uh, and the writer, uh, but she is a great source uh, about my knowledge of the Ashkabat community. Now, the, the uh, name of the city, Ashkabat in Russian, uh, in English is translated or transliterated in, in different ways, sometimes Ishkabat, sometimes Ishkabat with two words, with one word, 
Ashkabad, Ashkabad, it's, it's the same thing. And as Olga Mehti told me, Ashkabad means the city of love. Uh, so Olga, Olga was born uh, a year after the great Ashkabad earthquake of 1948. Uh, the city was uh, rapidly recovering and growing up, and I'm quoting from my interview with her. Uh, and she was very interested in the history of her city. Uh, she was interested uh, of uh, the Baha'i community that was there, of the uh, temple. And it turns out uh, she actually saw the wall, the walls of the world's first temple. Um, they remained intact. Uh, after the earthquake, and it turned out that her grandfather had actually built this temple. Uh, he had come from Yazd in Iran, along with other Baha'is who had been encouraged um, uh, to go there and uh, to start a community. Let me turn the slide. So she says, in this way, the history of uh, Baha'i faith was gradually revealed uh, to her and to other young people. Uh, and it was the history that was very closely related to the history of the city where she was born. She started collecting photographs. Uh, she was talking to relatives and members um, of uh, that uh, historical Baha'i community of Ashkabad. Um, and uh, she became the main researcher, now living in Russia, the main researcher that uh, wrote about this community and that possesses, I think, uh, the best knowledge, the most accurate knowledge about what was going on there. So in my brief presentation of the community of Ashkabad, I will um, be relying on the interview with Olga. And finally, the third uh, major source of my presentation, whom I'd like to mention, is Yelena Mitnik. Uh, Yelena Mitnik uh, served as an editor-publisher at the Baha'i Unification or Unity Publishing House uh, for uh, 20 years, from 1993 to 2013. Um, now she is an ind independent researcher. Um, but uh, in the spirit of service, uh, Elena has been exploring the life and literary works of Isabella Grinevska, another uh, interesting figure in the history of the Baha'i faith in Russia. She was a famous uh, translator, critic, poet, writer, playwright of the late 19th century and the first quarter of the 20th century. Now, the thing is that um, Isabella Grinevska has a double namesake. Isabella Grinevska. But the second Isabella Grinevska was a Jewish writer uh, who wrote in Yiddish and Russian. Uh, later, I think she immigrated um, somewhere. But uh, if you open uh, the Russian Wikipedia, uh, uh, our Baha'i Isabella Grinevska and that second uh, Isabella Grinevska are merged into one person. Um, and that confusion. Um, was uh, clarified by Yelena Mitnik, it seems to me for the first time, because she worked uh, with the sources, with the original sources. Uh, she published some of Grinevska's, uh, Baha'i, our Baha'i Grinevska's most significant works. Uh, she's uh, her uh, book, Travel to the Land of the Sun. Um, it is being published now piece by piece. So she was working with the archives, and um, her task is to uh, reconstruct and restore uh, the real uh, life uh, and work of Isabella Grinevska, who is completely forgotten uh, in the mainstream Russian culture. So the, the most interesting thing about Grinevska is that um, she wrote two dramatic poems, The Bab in 1903, and uh, Baha'u'llah. In Russian, it was spelled Baha'u'llah, um, which were devoted to the key moments in the history of the Baha'i faith. Uh, to achieve greater theatricality, she slightly altered the events, but um, uh, when she made pilgrimage uh, to Akka and saw and talked to Abdu'l-Baha, Abdu'l-Baha 
uh, approved of both poems, and Krinevsky became the first and the only person uh, who wrote um, uh, dramatic poems about the founders, uh, the twin prophets of the Baha'i faith, um, approved by Abdul Baha, because uh, generally speaking, uh, Baha'is uh, should not uh, make the uh, founders of the faith and their families the characters in their literary works. So therefore, um, Grinevska is unique in this respect. So now let me uh, move on to the Russian history. And here we have an interesting confusion again. Uh, all Baha'is know that uh, Baha'u'llah, after, um, after announcing his revelation around 1963, wrote a series of letters uh, uh, or I may be wrong, uh, now it escapes me when exactly Baha'u'llah addressed the leaders of the world, either before or after, I think after, but it doesn't really matter for my presentation. Uh, so let me say this. Everybody knows that Baha'u'llah at some point addressed the leaders of the world. Um, and uh, those letters or epistles are collected um, as the summons of the lords of hosts. Uh, one of those letters um, was addressed to the Russian Tsar. And the letter was especially important because uh, the Russian Tsar was the only uh, political leader at that time. We are talking about 1852, early 1850s, when actually helped, who actually helped Baha'u'llah when he was imprisoned and offered him an exile in Russia. And uh, in his letter, uh, Baha'u'llah uh, thanks uh, the Tsar uh, and actually mentions that he was the only one. So um, where is the confusion? The confusion is that if you look at those letters, uh, you will see that uh, the letter the, the title of the letter says that the letter addressed is addressed to the Tsar Alexander II. Now, uh, when the letter was written, the Russian Tsar was Alexander II. However, the Russian Tsar, who actually offered Baha'u'llah uh, the exile in Russia, was his father, Tsar Nicholas I. The thing is that Tsar Nicholas I died in 1855. Uh, he was the Russian emperor between 1825 until 1855. And um, the Russian Tsar Nicholas I uh, is known in the history of Russia as uh, a reactionary Tsar. His reign started with the failed uh, Decembrist revolt of 1825 when uh, the nobility uh, wanted uh, a constitution and some kind of reforms uh, and re liberalization, but he crushed this revolt. And he's mainly remembered in history as a reactionary whose controversial reign was marked by geographical expansion, centralization of administrative policies, administrative policies, and repression of dissent. Now, his biographer, uh, it is 20th century Russian scholar, Nicholas Ryazanovsky, um, um, the Tsar's biographer said that uh, in his public persona, I quote, Nicholas I came to represent autocracy, personified. Infinitely majestic, determined, and powerful, hard as stone, and relentless as fate. So it is, this is this Tsar that actually tried to help Baha'u'llah uh, in spite of him being a reactionary. And uh, it is this Tsar um, that was ready to accept Baha'u'llah uh, and his relatives. Um, in Russia. Now, the question is uh, whether Baha'u'llah was addressing his letter to remembering this Tsar, or he was addressing this letter to his son. Now, his son, 
Tsar Alexander II, uh, became the emperor of Russia in 1855 when his father died. And um, his father started the Crimean War that lasted for three years, from 1853 to 1856. Uh, the uh, outcome of this war was unfavorable to Russia. And Alexander II, unlike his father, initiated a program of domestic reforms. So he is known in the history of Russia as a reformer. Uh, in 1861, he emancipated the serfs. That was something historical, equal in importance to uh, the emancipation of slaves in the United States. Uh, for this act, he was called the Tsar Liberator. In 1864, he initiated the judicial reform, uh, introduced elective local self-governing cell self-governing cell assemblies known as zemstvas, a series of military reforms included uh, the army statute, statute of 1874, which for the first time in Russia established conscription, making military service legally binding for young men of all classes. So the, the question is, um, to which czar uh, Baha'u'llah actually addressed his letter? So I believe that uh, Baha'u'llah addressed his letter to the institution of Tsardom. He was not interested in a particular person. He was thankful that one of the Russian czars uh, actually try, uh, tried to help him. Uh, but he was more interested in uh, his personal message to the czar. And as we know, that message was not so much favorable. Uh, so in 1852, at the height of the persecution of the Babis, when Baha'u'llah then imprisoned, uh, I, I quote, I quote often from my interviews, was facing reprisals and the death penalty, a representative of the Russian diplomatic mission in Tehran extended his helping hand. In the epistle to the Russian Tsar, which was written, I assume, much later, the founder of the new religion wrote about this episode. Whilst I laid chained and fettered in the prison, one of thy ministers extended me his aid. Wherefore hath God ordained for thee a station which the knowledge of none can comprehend, except his knowledge. Beware lest thou barter away this sublime station. Okay. So I'm looking at the questions. I see that the questions are coming. Uh, so let me uh, say it again. Uh, please, if you watch us live, um, you can ask the questions in the Q&A uh, chat if you watch us on Zoom. And you can uh, ask uh, questions on YouTube, also uh, in YouTube chat. Uh, if you uh, don't want to ask anything, please write something, uh, write where you are watching us from, um, write what you think about the topic, write what you think about what is happening in Russia, write, uh, you know, uh, anything pertaining to the topic of my talk, because the more comments we do have, the better the YouTube will make uh, afterwards. So now let me continue. Uh, here is another quotation from Baha'u'llah, and that comes from the summons of the Lord of Hosts. Epistle to the Russians are continued. Beware lest thy sovereignty withhold thee from him who is the supreme sovereign. Arise thou amongst men in the name of this all-compelling cause, and summon then the nations into, unto God the exalted the great. Could Couldst thou but know the things sent down by my pen and discover the treasures of my cause and the pearls of my mysteries which lie hid in the seas of my names and in the goblets of my words, thou wouldst in thy love for my name and in thy longing for my glorious and sublime kingdom lay down thy life in my path. Now, um, just to finish with the Tsar Alexander II, to whom... Um, as it is traditionally um, uh, perceived, uh, Baha'u'llah 
wrote this letter. Alexander II did modernize Russia. Uh, he released political prisoners, accepted Western-style culture and technology, but he stopped short of establishing the parliament um, as the people's representative and decision-making institution. Uh, unfortunately, there was a failed assassination attempt on him in 1866, and as a result of that, he turned to conservatism and repressive policies following his father. Uh, his reactionary politics brought the resurgence of revolutionary movement and revolutionary terrorism. And on March the 1st of 1881, when the Tsar finally decided to convene a parliament and ratify the first Russian constitution, precisely on that day, he was assassinated by the members of the revolutionary terrorist organization, People's Will. So the next Tsar, uh, who uh, was his son, obviously, uh, but who is also associated with the development of the Baha'i faith in Russia, was Tsar Alexander III. Alexander Romanov uh, was the emperor of Russia from 1881 until he died in 1894. Um, the rule of Alexander III was reactionary, uh, obviously, after uh, the assassination of his father. He established the policy known as counter-reforms and reversed many liberal initiatives of his father, Alexander II. Under the influence of a Russian statesman and advisor to the Tsar, Konstantin Pobedonostsev, Alexander III was against any political or social changes that challenged his authoritarian power. On the bright side, Russia fought no significant wars during his tenure. Uh, so Alexander III is known as the peacemaker. During the reign of this Tsar, Baha'is in Ashkabat, which was then part of the Russian Empire, enjoyed, enjoyed equal protection under the law, along with other inhabitants of that state. And that was evidenced by the construction of the first Baha'i temple in Ashkabat, and by impartial investigation of the murder of one Baha'i by um, the Shia fanatics, resulting in the severe sentencing of the murderers. It also, it's also happened that during the reign of Alexander III, uh, another quotation from my interview with Yuli Ioannisian, for the first time in Baha'i history, a fair trial organized by the Russian authorities over the murderers of, the, of a Baha'i martyr in Ashkabad confirmed the independent character of the Baha'i religion from Islam at the legal level. Now, uh, why do we say that and how do we know that? Because when you testify on the trial, uh, you put your hand on the scriptures. And um, uh, Baha'is uh, were not putting their hand on the Bible or on the Quran. They put their hand on Baha'i texts. Uh, that was allowed by the judge, and the judge, by doing that, basically confirmed that Baha'i faith is an independent religion for the first time in its history. Uh, during the trial that took place in 1889, uh, the Russian authorities, uh, for the first time again in Baha'i history, in Russia or elsewhere, did not regard the new religion as an Islamic heresy or some kind of reformist movement. Um, uh, as I said, this was evidenced by, I quote, the fact that unlike Muslims, Sunnis, and Shiites swore on oath on the Quran or all in courts, or all in court without exception for Baha'is who participated in the trial as witnesses, the Quran oath was replaced by another procedure. Now, the murderers had been sentenced to death but at the request of the Baha'is themselves, this was the sentence was commuted to community service, as was also reported in the Russian press. And uh, here is how Baha'u'llah um, uh, how, how Baha'u'llah responded to that act. Uh, he wrote a letter to Tsar Alexander III. As far as I know, this letter uh, is not translated into English. I may not be aware of the translation, but I uh, have never seen it. It was translated uh, by Alexander Tumansky uh, 
at the turn of the century, in, in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, into from Arabic into Russian. Uh, and here is the translation uh, by Yuli Ioannisian from Russian into English. So therefore, this is a provisional translation, but um, here is a quotation from that epistle, a Baha'u'llah's epistle to the community of Ashkabat. Truly the shining power, may God strengthen it, has shown justice. This help of the power of light, that's how Baha'u'llah called Russia, by the way. Such a good title. Um, this help of the power of light, this demonstration of truth and justice, God willing, will erase the tyranny and violence of the world. To this community, we bequeath that it will not forget this justice and that from the depth of its heart, it will pray to God that he may continue and prolong with the longevity and power and kingship the exploits of him who holds the banner of justice for God alone designed to help those oppressed by all and decreed a just verdict. And this is the first aid which has been given to the oppressed thanks to the will of the greatest emperor and the most honorable general. May Almighty God strengthen them both. Now, usually when uh, uh, when people talk about Russia and the Baha'i faith, they are reminded of uh, Leo Tolstoy. There is a short book the, that uh, actually uh, tells us the story of Leo Tolstoy and his encounter with the Baha'i faith. Now, this is part of that second stream uh, of um, <clears throat> my research, um, which is about, which is not about the Baha'i faith in Russia, but the Baha'i faith and Russia and Russian culture, because Leo Tolstoy never became a Baha'i. Uh, and um, uh, Leo Tolstoy was um, well aware of the Baha'i faith, of the spread of the Baha'i faith. He was uh, exchanging letters with Abdul Baha. He met Baha'i representatives. He wanted to write a book about the Baha'i faith. Um, but um, Leo Tolstoy uh, was a, a typically enlightenment type thinker. Uh, who went through a very long and complex religious evolution. Uh, he started as a secular uh, writer uh, who wrote his famous novels, War and Peace and Anna Karenina. But in the uh, 1870s, he underwent a profound spiritual crisis, when, uh, uh, which he described in his A Confession. And as a result of that, he started his spiritual search, with which first led him to uh, become the Orthodox Christian. But then uh, he studied Greek and Hebrew uh, and made his own translation of the four Gospels from the original Koine Greek. Um, after making this translation, uh, he realized that the Orthodox Christian teaching is not compatible, fully compatible with what Christ, uh, with what Christ actually taught. And he rebelled against the Orthodox Christian Church. In the early 20th century, he was excommunicated from uh, the Orthodox Christian Church. Uh, Tolstoy um, studied uh, all world religions. Uh, he uh, practiced interreligious dialogue. Uh, in those days, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, he made a collection of the greatest sayings from uh, world religious leaders and the world greatest thinkers like Lao Tzu and Confucius, etc. Um, so he was very, he was a very progressive guy. If uh, you know, we are talking about that uh, time. Uh, he even uh, created his own religious sect, which is known as um, the group of people who stand for the nonviolent resistance uh, against evil. Uh, Tolstoy thought that this uh, sentence, nonviolent resistance to evil, covers the essence of what Christ actually taught. And uh, he articulated uh, his creed in such books as The Kingdom of God is Within You, 
uh, uh, the book that had a deep impact on Mahatma Gandhi in India with Gandhi's uh, peaceful transition to India's independence, and on Martin Luther King Jr., among others, um, on his uh, nonviolent resistance uh, to slavery and to the vestiges of slavery. So uh, as for Leo Tolstoy and the Baha'i faith, he first heard about the Babis in 1884. Um, and um, his attitude to the faith was ambiguous. And I'm, I'm quoting from various sources, articles, and books. Uh, it was ambiguous because Tolstoy did not have access to the fullness of information about the Baha'i teachings. And um, his lack of knowledge, uh, as well as the inconsistency of his own philosophical views, sometimes led Thinker to reject the faith. That is a question from uh, the article by Ackerman, Nancy Ackerman and Graham Hussle. Now, I would disagree. Uh, his philosophical views were not inconsistent. They were quite consistent. And um, he was an Enlightenment-type thinker who believed that uh, all people are equal. And um, if Christ had not uh, realized the ultimate truth of human existence, you know, nonviolent resistance to evil, then he, Leo Tolstoy, would have realized it by himself. In other words, Tolstoy rejected the idea of the manifestation of God or the prophecy in Judaism or the incarnation in Christianity. He rejected the idea of those special people who are intermediaries between God and the rest of humanity. Uh, and uh, since he rejected that, um, he, would, uh, uh, he would have accepted the teaching uh, by the Baha'is, uh, Baha but um, he would not have accepted the overall um, structure of leadership. Um, that's my view. Abdul Baha knew that Tolstoy was interested in the faith. He advised Baha'is um, to contact him. Um, in 1902, Tolstoy received a personal message from Abdul Baha. Uh, you could uh, you read the quotation later on. Um, and um, in 1902, when asked about his attitude toward Baha'u'llah and his, own, his cause, Tolstoy replied, how can I deny it? And yes, Tolstoy was a universalist, uh, a pacifist, uh, who would uh, readily accept the idea of global peace and security. So that's why he said that it is obvious that this cause will win over the whole world. Um, Tolstoy noted that the principles of Baha'i doctrine promoted the spirit of the age and would in time establish themselves in the world, ensuring humanity's prosperity. And about Baha'i faith in 1910, shortly before his death, Tolstoy wrote, um, very profound, I know of no other faith that is so deep. So uh, on this good and uh, uh, optimistic note, let me uh, move from Tolstoy to Russian scholars. I see that uh, our time is moving fast. So I will try to speed up my presentation. Uh, among Russian scholars, I will mention only three uh, persons. The first one is Baron Viktor Rosen. Uh, he's the most important guy. Uh, he's of equal importance to Edward Brownie, the famous English uh, Orientalist, um, who is known for having met Baha'u'llah. Um, uh, Viktor Rosen uh, was the academician of St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, professor and dean of the Faculty of Oriental Languages. Um, he left behind detailed descriptions of many Babis and Baha'i manuscripts, which are now preserved, not all of them translated yet, in the Institute of Eastern Manuscripts of the Russian Academy of Science. And these descriptions are illustrated with lengthy excerpts from the texts. Now, what is the main difference between Victor Rosen and Edward Brownie is that Edward Brownie was uh, more focused on uh, histories, the history of the movement, uh, personal interviews, 
while Victor Rosen, who was more focused on uh, compiling uh, the actual texts. Uh, so that's why many of those texts are now preserved uh, in St. Petersburg, Petersburg's archives. Um, now, even more, uh, he translated into Russian and published some of the Baha'i scriptures, including Glad Tidings. He also prepared for publication the collection of messages of the founder of the Baha'i religion, consisting of original texts in Arabic and Persian. Uh, the second one is Alexander Tumansky, who is his uh, pupil, his student. Um, he was born in 1861. Unfortunately, I could not find his uh, picture. So therefore, I put uh, the cover uh, the cover page of Kitab-i Agdas, of uh, the Most Holy Book, uh, which Tumansky translated. Um, uh, which, what was the year? I don't see it, but he, um, uh, this is his main accomplishment, the first translation into European language. I'm trying to see the year, 1894. So in 1894, uh, he produced the first translation into European Russian language of uh, the most holy book. Subsequently published with the original commentaries and an appendix of other texts. Uh, this is really a very interesting book that is available nowadays for free on the internet in Russian language. Uh, but Tomaski also published the will and testament of Baha'u'llah in the original and in translation, as well as several other texts. We do not know whether Tomaski was a Baha'i or not. There are some legend, legendary stories that he declared himself a Baha'i during one of his trips. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, um, it is not um, confirmed with uh, any written material. And uh, the third uh, scholar I would like to mention was Ignaty Kras uh, Krachkovsky. He was a Russian and Soviet uh, Arabist academician, uh, this guy wrote an obituary to the death of Abdul Baha, uh, whom this scholar knew personally. Uh, the obituary published in 1923 said in part, I quote, Abdul Baha settled in Haifa at the foot of Mount Carmel and enjoyed great influence among representatives of all nations and religions, as well as all classes of people through the charm of his distinguished personality. In his whole figure and address, there was an inner majesty and great spiritual power, which had a charming effect on everyone, even those who met him by chance." End quote. As far as I know, Krachkovsky was not a Baha'i. So this is a testimony of a person uh, who, was, uh, who actually knew um, Abdul Baha and who wrote such an obituary. Now let me turn to Isabella Grinevska. Uh, Isabella Grinevska was born in 1864, died in 1944. She was a Baha'i. Um, she was a Baha'i even uh, during the Soviet times, during the so-called silent years or dark years. Uh, her uh, address and phone number uh, were mentioned um, in the Baha'i sources of that time. Uh, but obviously, she did not advertise her Baha'i identity. In fact, uh, she was trying to hide uh, much of her biography. And this is one of the sources of the confusion between her and her double namesake, another Isabella Grinevska, which lived around the same time, uh, which was also, who was also a, a writer. Now we know that uh, our Isabella Grinevska was born in Poland, which was then part of the Russian Empire. She studied at the Mariinsky Gymnasium in Grodno, and then at the National Natural Department of the Pedagogical Courses of St. Petersburg, uh, of, Sa of the St. Petersburg Female Gymnasiums. She graduated in 1877. Now, in my uh, presentation of Grinevska, I use uh, the research of Helena Mitnik as the main source, and the only source, I should say. Now, Grinevska's publications appeared on the pages of many journals in Russia. 
theater and art, world illustration, uh, Новое время, which means new time, pictorial review, Herald of Europe, etc., etc. But her most significant works are the dramatic poem Bob, uh, which she wrote in 1903. The second edition was published in 1916. And the poem tragedy Baha'u'llah, Beha'u'llah, The Glory of God. It was written in 1912, which are dedicated to the key moments in Baha'i history. So Isabella Grinevsky wrote about her second religious philosophical poem. Um, I quote, in my tragedy, Beha'u'llah, I depict the life of the Babi community from the time of their flight from Persia until the year of the demise of Baha'u'llah. Baha the action itself begins a week or more before the, his expulsion from Baghdad to Constantinople, although the speeches of the characters from the first act also indicate the preceding events, the very emergence of Babism, the death of the Bab, and the persecution of the Babis in Persia itself. Uh, Babis should be with the capital B, not babies, Babis. In parallel, the external and internal tragedies of the life of Baha'u'llah are portrayed. Now, the poem is available, or actually both poems are available for free on the internet in Russian language. They have not been translated into the English language. But, um, you know, I uh, decided to translate just uh, one, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, one very small portion of the poem, the end of the poem, when Baha'u'llah is speaking, addressing to his followers. Um, I, I, I was trying to uh, translate it in such a way as to render the original Russian meter. So uh, Baha'u'llah proclaims to his followers, but angrily you must not answer, brothers, to scolding and to curses. I, sw I swear by the novel day of spring, God wills that among you or brethren, as in days of peace in motions and in words, let heaven's silence reign, reign, I say. You'll sweep away your troubles, and only in beauty will you charm. We'll dissipate in love and beauty's rays all troubles in a moment, like pitiful light ashes. Now, when uh, Isabella Grinevsky met Abdul Baha, she made a pilgrimage and was able to meet her, uh, to meet him. Uh, Abdul Baha, and this quotation comes from Grinevsky's own book, Journey to the Lands of the Sun, uh, which was not published until uh, recent years and is not published yet completely. The publication is ongoing, uh, but hopefully the whole uh, book will be published uh, soon. So this is the quotation uh, when Abdul Baha actually responded after listening to her. Uh, poems. You are the first woman to pave the way for the knowledge of the Bab and Baha'u'llah in the poet's portrayal. There have been many women uh, kings in Europe and Asia, but what is left of them? One Mary Magdalene, who was a simple woman, by her spiritual love of God is still alive today. What I mean to say is that you have put much labor uh, in not being satisfied with earthly pleasures that you have ascended to the height of the spiritual world, that you have covered in the realm of peace for the good of man, and therefore rest assured that your labors will not go waste. Beha'u'llah will be translated into all languages and will be staged on all stages. It will be played even in Persia, he predicted. Uh, now uh, I see that uh, we are... Uh, moving to the end of my presentation, and I, I do move to the end of it. Um, I will say a couple of words about the history of the Baha'i community of Ishkabad. Of course, I can say a lot about this because I've read um, a lot of uh, articles in Russian, uh, a lot of uh, historical evidence. Um, it is a very interesting story, um, and it is full of horror when it comes to uh, the beginning of the Soviet Union and the, the beginning of Soviet repressions, 
There is one book in English that is called The Years of Silence. Uh, it is a short book of 90 to 100 pages, uh, which describes in great detail, in horrible detail, um, the tortures um, uh, of those Baha'is who were um, captured by uh, the Soviet communists, uh, imprisoned, uh, then tortured, then exiled. Uh, but here is the uh, synopsis, the main outline. Uh, in 1882, persecuted believers from Persia found refuge in Turkestan. And as a result, I quote, uh, the, at the end of the 19th century, the first Baha'i community abroad appeared in the Russian Empire in Ashgabat. Uh, contrary to the uh, traditions and customs of society at the time, the Baha'is of Ashgabat opened two schools for boys and girls, regardless of their social and religious backgrounds. Uh, a library, reading room, hospital, and dormitory for pilgrims were built next to the Baha'i temple erected in Ashgabat in the early 20th century, providing not only a place to worship, but also opportunities to acquire knowledge and receive assistance and support. Uh, I take this text. I, I took this text from um, a brief introduction, the uh, history of faith in Russia. Um, but the introduction is in Russian, so therefore, uh, translation is mine. Uh, in the 1880s, Baha'i communities emerged not only in Ashgabat, but in Moscow, Saint Petersburg, Kazan, Baku, Tashkent, Samarkand, and other cities of the Russian Empire. On the left side, you see the picture uh, of the first um, spiritual assembly of Moscow. So this is 1880s. But after the change in the political system in the Russian state in 1917, uh, Baha'is were first restricted in their activities. And in the late 1920s, they were either expelled from Russia or sent into exile in Siberia and Kazakhstan. Uh, the persecution obviously peaked in 1938. These are the years of Stalin's purges, when all Baha'i communities were virtually destroyed. Uh, the few remaining believers, while being faithful to their beliefs, submitted to a government that prohibited religious activities, including uh, Grinevska, who was able to survive, uh, but who uh, kept living in isolation. And the resurgence of the Baha'i faith in Russia dates back to uh, the end of 1990s, right before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Here you see the first uh, national assembly or spiritual assembly of Russia. Uh, the, the dark period in the history of the faith in the Russian state lasted until the 1990s, when Baha'is once again had the opportunity to share the word, the word of God with their fellow citizens and to revive the administration institution, the administrative institutions of the faith. Um, at this stage, and now well, let me say that uh, this comes from a brief essay, The History of, uh, History of Faith in Russia, and by saying at this stage, they probably meant before uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. So um, let's say in uh, the 2000s, uh, there have been about 35 Baha'i communities in the Russian Federation. Russian believers came from various walks of life, uh, had different nationalities and religious backgrounds. Uh, and uh, Russian Baha'is, of course, believe that Russia's spiritual and material progress is inevitable. Although I personally, um, you know, would not be that optimistic now and today. And finally, let me um, end my presentation. It's almost an hour. Let me end my presentation by outlining some issues and questions for discussion. Uh, what happened to the Baha'i faith in Russia after the war against Ukraine? Uh, in one word, uh, troubles. Uh, or another word, the catastrophe. Um, because um, many Baha'is fled Russia again um, because they feared for their lives. They feared 
for the lives of their um, relatives, and they feared for religious persecution. Um, now, religion uh, is, well, some kinds of religion are persecuted in Russia, Jehovah's Witnesses. But Baha'is are not under persecution. They are trying to, um, to sustain a very, very complex balance between being honest to their teachings and, uh, you know, being cooperative with the state. However, the state now is strictly authoritarian, closer and closer to becoming totalitarian, uh, and therefore uh, Baha'is who have to support their state um, find themselves in the situation of a serious conflict of conscience. Uh, what is the policy of the Universal House of Justice? The policy toward mobilization in Russia is that Russians, bah Russian Baha'is, um, have to choose for themselves whether to flee the country, whether to avoid mobilization, whether, whether to be mobilized by not to participate in military action. This is up to uh, the individual Baha'is. What is the policy of the National Spiritual Assembly of Russia toward the war? Um, I talked to many Baha'is and they told me that they experienced a lot of conflicts. Uh, some Baha'is left the church, the, sorry, the religion, uh, because um, of different positions regarding the war. Uh, so therefore, they decided uh, to avoid completely any discussion of anything that is somehow related to the conflict, to Putin, to autocracy, to what is happening in Russia, to repressions, just nothing. Uh, so when they meet, it is only prayers, uh, moral support, uh, you know, friendly discussions, and that's it. Uh, it is. It was quite difficult, uh, but uh, Baha'is are allowed to have their individual positions uh, regarding what is happening in Russia. Now, I, I already said about massive immigration. The immigration is so massive that the person who is in charge of the public relations in the Baha'i community of Russia, told me that he estimates uh, that there are no more than 2,000 Baha'is left in Russia, in the whole Russia. Now, uh, Russian population is about 100, 140 million people. So about 2,000 are left in Russia. Everybody else is everywhere. So therefore, Baha'i faith is, is practically collapsing on the institutional level. And uh, there is a drastic decrease in the number of Baha'is in the Russian Federation. And um, uh, I was given an article by a non-Baha'i scholar. Uh, it is the first article in Russian uh, about Baha'i faith that is trying to uh, measure sociologically uh, the number of Baha'is and the trends in the Baha'i development in Russia. And uh, the uh, conclusion of the author of the article is that the Baha'i project has failed in Russia. I will not uh, go into details, uh, but um, the short-term failure of the Baha'i project in Russia obviously is due to um, highly nationalistic Russian feelings, um, which uh, are flourishing after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So from the Soviet atheistic internationalism, Russians massively came to orthodox, nationalistic um, uh, Christianity. And since Baha'i faith is uh, a global, international organization, it, is it may be regarded as a contrary to the spirit of orthodoxy. And, uh, you know, hyper-orthodoxy, which is now flourishing in Russia. So Russians um, kind of uh, moved, switched from atheism to orthodoxy in just uh, one day, and uh, without any serious thought, uh, without any um, <laughs> learning of the old Greek and translating uh, the, the New Testament like Leo Tolstoy did, 
Um, so uh, from one blind faith to atheism uh, to another blind faith in orthodoxy. So I, I think these are the most important uh, features of this short-term term failure. But uh, Baha'i community is there, and they are struggling not to get eliminated again. Uh, so with this, I will finish my uh, presentation. I'm sorry, I went over the time. It's one hour and almost 10 years. But I hope we may have five or 10 minutes for questions. Let me stop sharing the screen. Uh, hi, Robert. I see you. And I want to uh, thank you before you take the turn to the questions. And I'm sure we have time for for uh, for for quite a few. I, I just wanted to make one quick comment that it may yes. very well be that the first person of European background to become a Baha'i may not have been Thornton Chase. It may have been a Russian. We don't yeah. know. And Alexander a, Alexander Tomansky, most yeah. probably Alexander Tomansky, because according to the uh, writings, uh, he was a translator. He went into the Baha'i community, Babi community, Baha'i community. He was among them, and uh, he declared Baha'i back then. It was an oral declaration, yeah. uh, but he never advertised this. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think this is an important thing to point out, and and we still don't know the details of when some of these early communities got organized. Uh, in the Russian Empire, but some of them may very well, well, certainly Eshkabad predates Chicago. Uh, but we, for all we know, there may be uh, communities more in uh, European Russia that predate Ma predate Chicago and the other uh, early American Baha'i communities. And this is, I think, a fascinating thing that we still need to uh, discover. Well, look, the first Moscow community uh, was organized in the 1880s. Yeah. So it is most surely predates uh, uh, American community, which was organized in the beginning of the 20th century, but uh, not so much known about those people. And uh, those Russian researchers are now working in the archives, trying to reconstruct uh, as much as possible the whole history. Absolutely. It's, it's a very, very important subject. And, and I'm so delighted that you've been able to present this to us, you know, when um, the Iron Curtain was falling, the National Spiritual Assembly invited Farouz Kazemzadeh to go to Boston and hold a weekend long seminar with about 30 people about the history of Russia. And I was privileged to be there and to listen to his several days of lectures about Russian history. And he also talked about the situation with the Eshkabad Baha'is being sent to uh, Siberia and how his family in Moscow was sending them care packages and Persian Baha'is even in Moscow were disappearing. And yeah. uh, it's really quite chilling and quite, quite amazing. But we should turn to the question and answer now. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking at YouTube and uh, thank you guys for uh, writing uh, something because it uh, will broaden our audience. I see that people are uh, watching us from Florida, from Ireland, from Canada, North Carolina, New Zealand, um, uh, North Carolina again. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to get to the questions. Um, Alex Boysen is writing, the subject is one previously written known to Baha'is and hence immensely valuable for a better understanding of its historical development. Uh, regarding the proclamation of both its followers and by others, including historians and the growth of the work. Okay, so this is a comment, not a question. Uh, let me see. Watching from Las Vegas. Um, um, our speaker pointed out that the theme of Grinevsky's historical works conveyed the tragedy in Baha'i terms, crisis of the faith history, yes. Um, but she also wrote a book, uh, and that was her final work. The book about her uh, travel to Akka and her meeting with Abdul Baha, uh, and it is a book size, and was never translated, was never available. Uh, was still in the archives, and Yelena found it, and uh, now she is uh, 
publishing it with her um, notes. Uh, let me see. Um, Addison has a good uh, comment down there about who in Baha'u'llah's oh, family was married to a Russian. Yeah, I I do not know about that. It was, I believe it was, as she said, uh, his sister, because as I understand it, his his sister, then her husband was work, worked for the Russian legation in Tehran, and that's why Baha'u'llah was able to have a connection with the, uh, the Russian legation uh, in Tehran. Okay, thank you, Robert. We have uh, three comments, uh, one by Megan Victory. Megan, hi, how are you doing? Um, is the approved dramatic poem about the Bob and the, the one about Baha'u'llah available anywhere? Any chance there is an English translation already as well? No, sorry, no English translation. Uh, but uh, yes, they are available in Russian, and they are quite long. Uh, so I, 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 I'm not as good in poetry as to translate the whole thing, but uh, look, maybe I should try, after all. Uh, at least I tried one portion. Uh, it sounded okay to me. Uh, what uh, resources, books are available for further research about the Baha'i faith in Russia? Not many. In fact, uh, most of my sources are in Russian and actually are personal sources because I conducted interviews uh, with those three, well, actually with four guys. Um, um, and um, as for the English sources, there is a book, The Silent Years, uh, that was published by uh, Ronald uh, Publisher in 1999, I believe. It's uh, 90 pages. Of, of horrible descriptions of how Baha'is were treated during Stalin's purges. Uh, but, um, you know, nothing new for uh, Russians because uh, everybody was treated this way if you were imprisoned and put into the gulag. Uh, so, uh, Car Carlota Garcia is writing, please provide any sources translated into English. Look, if you... Um, Mm -hmm. Let me uh, share my screen again, and let me uh, come back to the sources. So here you have uh, Alizad, um, oops, sorry, Asadullah, Years of Silence, Baha'is in the USSR, 1938-1946. This source is available. Um, Nancy Ackerman, who was a pioneer in Russia for 10 years, she is now living in Canada. Uh, I contacted her again personally and talked to her about her experience in Russia. And Graham Hassel, they wrote uh, a, an article, The Baha'i Faith in Russia, historical essay, but it is, um, it is in Russian. Uh, it, it is um, a preface to the translation of the book, The Baha'i Faith, The Emerging Global Religion, uh, and um, the article is in Russian. Uh, everything else is only in Russian. Uh, so therefore, yeah, I, I keep thinking about uh, writing an English book about Baha'i Faith and Russia, uh, uh, in which I could summarize all of this. So, uh, Robert, do we have anything sure, else? There is, there, there is some more from um, from the YouTube. I can read it out. Um, uh, could, you, could you please? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, Alex's question, um, he started out with, uh, our excellent speaker pointed out that the theme of Grinevskaya's historical works convey the tragedy in Baha'i terms crisis of the faith's history. So he goes on to say, might its counterpart, the victory of the faith, also have been conveyed to the same or a different extent? And why, why not uh, might this balance or imbalance of the crisis and victory aspects have been conveyed? Now, uh, if uh, by crisis, uh... Alex means the situation with Baha'i faith in Russia back then. Uh, now the situation is better anyway. So far, uh, Baha'i faith is uh, officially accepted and uh, organized in Russia. 
uh, it has a very good relationship with the Orthodox Church. Um, so um, they are trying to maintain this balance. But uh, if you are talking about this uh, early history, 19th century, 20th century, that was a serious crisis. Um, whether this crisis is somehow related to uh, how the faith was developed in the West, that is uh, a uh, big question, because we are still in the early stages, and uh, we do not know how things will turn out to be. Uh, what will the destiny of the Baha'i faith in Russia will be? Um, so let's wait for uh, 200 years and come back <laughs> and discuss that, or someone else will discuss that. Yeah, if I can add to that, of course, Shoghi Effendi talks a lot about the alternation of crisis and victory. And if you happen to be writing uh, the history of a particular community at, during the crisis stage, you might not have access to the victory stage that follows. And so any community goes through this alternation of expansion and then challenges of various sorts and then another expansion. and and. And the Russian community certainly has gone that, through that too. Right after the fall of the Soviet Union, the expansion was immense. Huge yeah. numbers of people, especially English-speaking people who were translators, became Baha'is. Uh, and it's and the spread and the faith spread all over the place too, quite widely. Yeah. Uh, yes. And then, of course, that growth slowed down as the the, the repression began to mount, and as the the whole country moved more towards a conservative. Uh, nationalistic and, and um, orthodox kind of view of things, which is obviously a much less uh, conducive environment for growth. So, so you know, we, we'll have to wait and see where things will go in the future. And we see the same thing in the United States, where we have periods of rapid growth and periods of, of plateauing. So, Yes, I agree. There's another um, YouTube question in the chat. Okay, uh, Shole and uh, Sina Hakiman, uh, may you please kindly explore the, in details the Baha'i institution's relation in Russia with the current government, including to pursue the goals of the nine-year plan in that country, if possible. Look, uh, uh, my friends, in Russia, uh, Baha'is are now surviving. Um, it's not so much about nine-year plan, but about survival. Uh, because when I uh, was speaking to my Russian Baha'i friends and they um, came to know that I have, uh, I have my YouTube channel and uh, in that channel I have some videos and I had some videos in Russian about the Baha'i faith. And um, when they uh, came to know that, they asked me to uh, eliminate them from my channel because they are afraid that uh, even a slight, even a slight uh, uh, hint uh, that Baha'i faith is somehow related to some foreign influence or uh, foreign sponsorship or uh, something, you know, imperialism, etc., uh, may trigger um, their extermination, their elimination, or their being proclaimed uh, the so-called foreign agent, agent, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they are keeping a very low profile. Uh, they um, are trying to avoid any discussion of the situation with the war. Uh, they are not expanding. I don't think they are expanding. In fact, they are shrinking because people are leaving Russia. Um, when the first mobilization was taking place a year ago, one mil about one million Russians leave the country. Yeah. Just in six months. Um, and uh, obviously Baha'is are among them because uh, you can be conscripted uh, if you are older than 18 years old and if you are younger than if you are even if you are 60 years old, you can be conscripted. Um, and you, you never know. Uh, so therefore, um, I think now Baha'is uh, are simply trying to consolidate um, their membership and not to collapse, as Yuli told me. Yeah, that he is afraid that uh, 
uh, Baha'i community may collapse if those kind of repressions and things will go on for, you know, five more years. Um, so they are trying to consolidate uh, and to, to lay law uh, and uh, to wait for the better times. Baha'i institutions uh, are in very difficult situation because there are Russian Baha'is who are for Putin and there are Russian Baha'is who are against Putin. And uh, they are afraid of the split in, uh, within the Baha'i community. That's why, you know, the policy is completely avoid any discussion of the current political situation, of the current social situation, you know, economic situation. Uh, so the, the, the climate, the environment uh, is pretty tough. Polarization, the American political situation yeah. is similar, and we similarly have to be very careful with expressing personal feelings, uh, political feelings, because many, many Baha'is certainly have very strong personal political feelings, but uh, as Baha'is, obviously, we don't maintain any kind of official position. What other questions do we have? There's another, Addison says here, I don't know if you see it, please write the book. Right. It is very exciting <laughs> to learn of the trial of the people who murdered the Babis in Ashgabad. First of all, that Babi community was defended. The defension was historic. And second, the trial recognized the Babi faith as an independent world religion because some witnesses were allowed to swear on Baha'i scripture instead of a Bible or Quran. This is such a pivotal moment in Babi Baha'i history. Thank you for sharing this information. That's very true. Thank you, Addison. Yeah, That's very true. The descriptions of the Eshkabad community in 1906 by Western Baha'is when they were visiting it really are quite amazing. They were, it was a large community. It had a printing press and it had all of these dependencies that you've mentioned and uh, committees of all sorts. And when the, the uh, repression began in the 1920s, it was really quite difficult to repress the community at that point because it had so many resources. It had so many capable people, so many organizers. And they really had to chip away at them and haul people off to Siberia and force women and children back to Iran and and uh, confiscate property and everything. And it, it was a it was a horrific uh, thing that they did. Yeah. I don't so look, I think uh, it's time. It's time yeah. to <laughs> finish. Yeah, I don't see anything else. Certainly, again. Thank you so much, Michal, for this fascinating presentation. I'm delighted that you were able to pull this information together, and we're all looking forward to seeing what else can be uh, said, what else can be written uh, about the community. And there's just so much there that still needs to be found that it reminds me a bit of American Baha'i history in the 1980s when we were still discovering which communities were founded and when they were founded and all this and writing it down. Um, really for the first time, you know, uh, some of it anyway. Thank you everyone for joining uh, the Wilma Thank Institute you. today for this uh, webinar. We hope that you take the information home and share it with other people. Uh, and please have discourse with people about these topics. Um, please tell others about our series. And as Michal reminds everybody, like us, on YouTube, join our Facebook page so that you can hear about uh, more programs. And then of course, tell others that we have two more, uh, three more programs coming up actually in August. We hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.